go ahead and have a seat. And I have to confess something. I read the wrong letter <laughs> from that psalm. I was supposed to read Zayin. Uh, so I will do that during the second service. And next week, you guys get to hear the same song, Hef, as we just read today. <laughs> If you're watching online, glad you guys are here. Um, it's always a privilege to be able to serve and minister to the Lord as we're in the presence of His Word, going through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and everyone who is here. And if you are watching online, I highly encourage you to come to church, please. Just come to church. It's time we need to be together in the presence of the Lord. I know it's comfortable watching church in your pajamas and drinking coffee and uh, and all of that, that's totally understood, but it's a lot more fun when you're here with us. Yeah, you see, everybody's agreeing. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> and on top of that, you get to use your gifts with us. And the Bible does say, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. And it's just a good time to be in the presence of the Lord. As we are now, if you have your Bibles, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is introducing from chapter 10 to chapter 13, the end of the book, he is starting to introduce not necessarily a defense of the Apostle Paul. What he is doing is confirming his apostleship. He is being probably in this short passage from 10 to 13, the most personal that we see of Paul in the whole of all the books that he wrote. We see that we, he warred. We see that he went through difficulties. We see his travels through the book of Acts. We see each epistle that he wrote to the seven churches as he was writing how to be a believer and some of the things that he did. But these chapters, 10, 11, 12, and 13, are probably the most personal inward look at Paul. And it's an interesting set because if you read it, you can immediately say, oh, look, he's trying to defend who he is. He's trying to establish himself to the critics, and so therefore he is on the defense. And Paul never has that in mind. As a matter of fact, when Paul is confronted with criticism, he's confronted with the naysayers and those who want to put him down, he never stands up and says, hey, my name is Saul of Tarsus. I saw Jesus, and I'm the one. You can't say that about me. He doesn't take it personal. There are times, however... During the criticism and during the time when Paul was attacked, he did respond. And the response was in a way to assure who he was in Christ Jesus. Not who he was as Paul or Saul of Tarsus. Not who he was as the apostle sent out and the one working and striving and being thrown in jail and prisons and beatings and shipwrecks as we're going to see as we get into chapter 11. He doesn't have to stress that. But what he does want to do as we look at these is say, look, everything that is being done is based on a calling. This is based on something that was established long before I was even born. And that was finally confirmed when I met the Messiah on the road to Damascus. As he was telling me, Saul, you're going to go out. I'm going to change your name to Paul. You're going to be ministering to the Gentile church. And you're going to go through sufferings and trials and difficulties. And yet, Paul, I am going to use you in a mighty way. And so Paul always turned his critics not to himself in defense, but he turned the critics to his calling because of Jesus Christ, his mastership, his love, his headship, Jesus, on the Apostle Paul. So as we read this, we need to take to heart how many times someone has come against you. How many times someone has said something negative or slandered your name or brought your Christianity into question, brought your witness into question, has said something that would derail your entire existence as a Christian and what your response either is going to be because if you haven't had it happen yet, you will because that's what happens to believers. It's going to happen. What will your response be? And if you look back, how have you responded in the past? 
And sometimes we know that our response may not have been exactly what God wanted us to say. And we take it personal and we say, oh, you're coming against me. And because you're coming against me, let me lash out in my flesh because that's what I've been walking in instead of I'm outside of my flesh walking in the spirit because of my flesh. Therefore, I focus more on Jesus Christ than I do on what's going on with me. Let me point these critics to who he is and let God deal with it. And Paul understood this clearly. When you take, and, and he, we finished chapter 8 and 9 dealing with giving, and now he goes into this whole concept, and he says in verse 1 of chapter 10, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, I am bold towards you. I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence which by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So Paul opens up and he says, look, I myself, I'm pleading with you, I'm begging with you by meekness and gentleness in Christ. I am asking you, I am entreating you, I am wanting you not to look at me. He already admits what he is. You know, if you, if you read on, look at verse 2. He says, I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. People think I'm walking in the flesh. People think that I am bold because of what I write. Because of my letters, they're weighty, they're heavy. And you read these epistles that Paul wrote and you go, <laughs> you know, you should be convicted as you do read them because they are weighty and heavy. And he says, you know, but even though I'm walking in the flesh, even though my flesh is not something to be looked at. You see, there's, there are some people that you look at and just their presence, you kind of go, oh. I remember, I still re I'll never forget this in Sam's Club. You know, I'm standing at the register. I'm getting ready to be checked out. And I'm looking at a guy walking out. And as he's walking out, you know, he's pushing his cart. But he's pushing his cart, leaning down on the cart. And he wasn't leaning down on the cart because he was hurting. He was leaning down on the cart because his hands could not reach the cart because he was so tall. He had to bend down and grab it. And that, and that didn't do anything. It wasn't until I see him reach into the cart and with one hand pulls out a watermelon. And I'm looking at this guy going, oh, this guy, it, it's like you're in the presence of a giant. It's just this massive, you know. And, and those kind of impressions stick with you compared to, the wife that he was married to, who was probably four foot 11. <laughs> you know, and, and you look at that and it's like, you're, you're not looking at her, you're looking at this man, you're going to press, you know, somebody who's a large bodybuilder, someone of impressive size or impressive, you know, personality or whatever it is. And you go, that's someone that I would, wow, I can follow to the ends of the earth or whatever it may be, your favorite sportsman, your favorite teacher, your favorite presenter, whatever they may be. And Paul says, look, in the flesh, regardless of size, regardless of presence, regardless of establishment, regardless of wealth or whatever, Paul says, uh-uh, I'm coming to you and I'm pleading, I'm begging you with meekness and the gentleness of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ gentle? The answer is yes. Is he meek? And the answer is yes. But we misunderstand the definition of meek. We look at meekness as weakness. And oh, Jesus gentle, Jesus meek and mild. And we can't do that with Jesus because our King of kings and Lord of lords, our master, our savior, Jesus Christ is bold, is the King of kings, is the judge and is the one who's going to come. And I love the story of Jesus on two separate occasions when he cleared the Temple Mount. Did it at the beginning of his ministry? He did it at the end of his ministry. Two separate occasions. And when you're on the Temple Mount and you've got a couple hundred thousand people sitting there on the Temple Mount getting ready to celebrate Passover, 
and you see one guy take on the entire religious establishment, flipping over tables and setting the animals free. And we're not talking Tupperware tables like we have on the back. We're talking the marble tables of the money changers, the marble tables of the sellers and the establishment of commerce. And he flips them over and says, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. How dare you? And he's whipping these guys. He's chasing them out. And hundreds of thousands of people watching this one guy. He is not weak. He is strong. He is strength. He has got a presence. And Paul says, look, I want you to understand I'm pleading with you with the same meekness and, and gentleness of Jesus. And he says this, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. He says, look, I'm coming to you with the personality as Jesus. Even though I'm absent with you, my flesh isn't wild. Look at Paul. He says, but being absent, you know my boldness. And he says, I beg you that when I, am, uh, that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as we walked according to the flesh. In other words, I could come and I could nail you guys. I can, I can discipline you. I, I started your church. I am the one who put it in place. And if I come in my flesh, I will be just as bold as I was in my writings but I want you to fix it before I get there so I don't have to do that. You see, that's the heart of a pastor. That's the heart of someone who's saying, look, I don't want to come against you. I don't want to be mean to you. I don't want to uh, slam you in the dirt. Is it we walked according to the flesh? Do you walk in the flesh? That's a tough thing, isn't it? I don't walk in the flesh. I'm a Christian. Well, what exactly is walking in the flesh? Well, we're going to see a lot of this as we go. Because take a look at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, you notice, we do, therefore we, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according. See the difference? We walk in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. Why would Paul put warfare and walking in the same verse? You know, even though, okay, we're in the flesh. This tent, this tabernacle that I'm in, this shell that houses me. It's my flesh. It's my weight. It's my bones, my muscles, my sinews, my organs. This, this outward shell houses who I am, my soul, my personality, my being to make me alive. I walk in this and yet in my walk, there is a war constantly going on and people understand what a war is. We see this over and over. War morphs, it changes, you know, back when wars began, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Romans, the Scythians, the, the Assyrians, the Syrians, you know, and they had swords and it was a battle of the will, it was a battle of the might, it was face-to-face, one-on-one in the midst of the war. I got to kill you by walking right up to you and killing you. And then the bow and arrow was created and, and now I can do it at a distance. I can nail you from here to the wall. And the Scythians were so good that they were able to ride on horseback shooting behind them as they're going this way and taking a bird out of the air. That's how good they were. So now the bow and arrow comes in and I don't have to be face to face. And then we start to move and now gunpowder is invented. We see the muzzle loaders. We see how it worked and now we don't even need to be face to face in the fleshly war. All we have to do is say, oh, that's happening over there. And all I got to do is press a button here and no one has to see me do it. And that's taken care of. It's changed. However, the warfare that we're talking about has never changed. We're talking the spiritual warfare. We're talking the depth of Satan against God, good against evil, righteous against unrighteousness. So, you know, for though we walk in this flesh, we do not war according to the flesh because your flesh cannot war against the spirit. It is always in conflict. It is always battling against it, but your flesh will always lose. So what do we depend on? What, uh, how do we do this? What, what is it that we depend on? And, and when you're in war, it's not a fun place to be. You're in battle. It is not a fun place to be. You know, Paul, he's writing to the church of Ephesus, chapter 6, verse 12. And most of us know these verses. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, or he says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand 
in the evil day, having done all to stand. And then he goes on and he explains the armor of God. Your loins girt about with truth, your breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When you take a look at the warfare prep, there are a couple things to notice. And the first one is this. There is one offensive weapon. And what is it? It's the sword of the spirit, God's word. That's the offensive weapon. The rest of it's defensive. I'm wearing the armor. It's going to protect me from any onslaught. Now, here's the, query, the, the curious part about the armor. What's not covered? Your back. Everything is on the front. You see, we are in the battle. We are in the spiritual warfare. We are supposed to head forward. We are supposed to, to transition from here to there moving forward, not turning back and running away. Because here's what happens. When you turn and run the other direction, who are you losing sight of? Your leader, Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. He is the one who wins the battle for you. The book of Jude says, you know, and I, and I love it, that Michael the archangel did not bring a railing accusation against the devil, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. And if I've got Christ in front of me, my battle is always won. You see, as a born-again believer, we fight from victory. The victory is already won. I got the armor of God. I've got this breastplate. I've got the shield. I've got everything. I've got the word of God, and I can quote the word of God. But I've got Jesus in front of me who I am following because he's my shepherd. Meek. Mild, strong, firm, able to withstand everything. And if I stay behind him and follow him, I get through the battlefield victoriously. Here's the bummer. As I'm going through the battlefield, guess what happens? I get injured. Things blow up around me. I get shell-shocked, you know, and I get shrapnel or whatever. But I'm never defeated. I'm not defeated. I move forward, I move forward, I move forward. Eventually, the battle will stop. We, we, we look at this war. Now, the thing about this battle and the thing about this warfare, the thing about everything that goes on is this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8, it says this. There is no discharge in that war. You cannot be discharged from the battle as a believer. You cannot be inactive in war as a believer. And yet, there are many believers who just kind of sit. You know, as long as nothing bad happens. And the thing about the enemy is this. He knows the active believers. He knows the inactive believers. He will tempt by warfare the inactive believers and tell them, you're good. Don't worry about it. Just stay right here. You'll be safe. You'll be secure. You'll have everything you need. No one will harass you. And yet those who are in the battle following Jesus are the ones getting hurt and injured and penetrated and, and whatever it may be as they walk through because we know that you can't get through a battlefield without some kind of harassment. And yet the Satan that we see on this planet will deceive those who are sitting and say, you're in a good place. Don't move. Just stay there. And has God called us to stay? He hasn't. I love when the children of Israel... We're sitting on the edge of the Red Sea. And they hear the thunder. They see the cloud of dust rising over the edge. And they, all of a sudden, the Egyptian army comes up. And they're like, oh, Moses, you brought us out here to die. Look, here come the Egyptians. Everything was Moses' fault. Yeah, you brought us out here to die. The Egyptians are coming. And Moses goes to the Lord. And he says, Lord, we got the sea on this side. We got the Egyptian army on that side. We can't go to the right. We can't go to the left. What are we supposed to do? And you, know, you, you read the Lord's response to Moses. And he says, what are you standing here for? Why are you standing here? Go to the sea, raise your staff, and move forward. But the question, Lord, what do we do? God doesn't say, well, just stay there for a while. I'll beat it. No, he says, what are you standing here for? What are you talking to me? I asked you to leave Egypt. You think this is too hard? Move forward. Children of Israel see Moses raise a staff, the Red Sea parts, and they go. Fire stops the Egyptian army. We have to move forward. The book of Ephesians says, sit, stand, walk, run. That's the beauty of the walk of a believer. And when you take a look at this and you see how this war is fought, fight it from victory. Do not be a defeated Christian. Defeated Christians are useless. 
be a victorious Christian because it didn't Christ already win the battle? All right, so we won. Woohoo! You move forward and expect the bumps and the bruises. Because he does say in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So now we're going into the spiritual warfare. We're coming in. We got this battle. We got this warfare. We're like, oh, here we go, Lord. We're going to go. But I can't fight a spiritual battle with a fork, a spoon, a knife, a sword, or a gun. I have to fight it with what? I cannot fight it against the flesh. I have to fight it with the word of God as we see in Ephesians chapter 6. When you see the sword of the spirit. The word of God. Which penetrates deep. How much of the word do you take in? How much of the word do you read? How much of the word do you trust? Beauty is you can trust 100% of it. All of it. So we break down strongholds. It's not a problem. You can say, okay, Lord, I'm not going to come at this warfare carnally. I'm going to come at it spiritually. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would bind all the spiritual strongholds that are there. And this is not a, you know, you got to understand, this is not demon, demon, who's got the demon. This isn't like, oh, there's a spirit of lethargy. There's a spirit of gluttony. There's a spirit of, you know, adultery. There's a spirit of, you know, covetousness. It's all the enemy. It's all one enemy, Satan. And we come against it. You come against it with the word of God. When Jesus shows up to any exorcism because of a demonic possession, they fall down before him and say, we know who you are. You're the son of God. He says, shh, 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 quiet. Get out of him. And you see how the Lord wins the battle. Pray for the strongholds to be broken. If you have unbelievers in your family, pray for that stronghold to be broken. But you can't do it. Remember that. It's not your responsibility to break those strongholds. It's God. Let him do it. Pray for someone to come by. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty for the pulling down. So casting down arguments or imaginations. Arguments are imaginations because your imagination is trying to get your point across, trying to get everyone to agree with what your imagination says. Don't you hate that? That's what happens in arguments. Husbands and wives are arguing because you're trying to get your point across instead of stopping and saying, you know, you're right. Thank you. It always takes two to argue unless you argue with yourself. You know, if you argue with yourself, you usually lose. You know, it's just the way it goes. I hate doing that. You get up and you're having a conversation with someone else and you realize it's you. Arguments, these imaginations, these, these things that are there. And he says, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Here we go again, the knowledge of God. The Greek word, the gnosko, that means knowledge by experience, knowledge by learning, knowledge by seeing, knowledge by experiencing the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And we have to remember this as a born-again believer. God never once tells us, check your brain and turn it off when you come in and listen to teacher X, Y, and Z and then walk out and say, oh, everything they said is right. Don't do that. We have to understand that God has given us knowledge. It's discerning knowledge. It's spiritual knowledge. It's learning knowledge. It's taking book knowledge. Exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We need to stop doing that. Everybody who comes up and says, I am the epitome of knowledge. You better listen to me because I am always right. And I'm the one who knows more than you. Sometimes I think the uneducated farmer knows more than the PhD. Sometimes I think the PhD knows a whole lot more than... The super dense individual who's willing to argue about dumb things. Oh, that we would pray for the strongholds to be broken so that when we minister and confess Jesus Christ to others, their arguments and their knowledge of their arguments would die and that their knowledge of God would be built up. He goes on bringing every thought into captivity. How? To the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought. You got a problem with your thought life? Well, my thought life's pretty good. I do really good in my thought life. No, no, no. I, I wish we could say that. I wish you can say that. I wish I can believe it when you say that to me. But thoughts are something that only God knows. And so whatever you think, whatever you are thinking in your mind, whatever's in your heart, therefore, give it into captivity of Jesus Christ. To the obedience of Christ. Give it to him. Your thoughts should be about Christ. Your thoughts should always be, Lord. And, and, I, and I, I don't like this, but it is the way you do. Lord, how did you handle this? 
Because let me just say this, everything that you go through in your thought life, Jesus was confronted with. And you know how he handled it? He quoted the word of God. And which book, here's a, here's a test question, which book did Jesus quote most from? Isaiah? Nope. Deuteronomy. I heard Deuteronomy. You ever said that? You're right. Deuteronomy. He quoted more from the book of Deuteronomy than he did any other book. Why? Because it was the second law. I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. He did quote Isaiah quite a bit. But Deuteronomy was always there because he wanted us to understand that I am here to complete this. And I want you guys to be able to take captivity, all take into captivity, all your thoughts to obey Jesus Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. All disobedience will be, you know, the believers are going to be judged based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's what we see. The Bema Seed Judgment. We don't go through the great white throne judgment. We go through the Bema Seed Judgment. I can't wait for all the disobedience to be punished. Well, wait a minute. I just said, uh, make sure you take every thought into captivity. <laughs> I just failed, didn't I? Because I want them to get their own. All those people who hurt me, all those people that came against me, all those people that are really stupid when it comes to Christ. Lord, if they reject you, you deserve to judge them and they deserve to be judged. And then my flesh says, yeah, but you're one of those. You're not like that anymore. You know, Paul's experience bringing people into captivity and accusing them and bringing them into judgment and putting them into prison, voting them to die because of their rejection of the Jewish law. Paul could easily go back and say, oh, those things that I did. And he goes on in verse 7, verse 7, the first part of it kind of goes along with uh, verse 6. He says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? What do you look at when you see someone? Do you look at their outward appearance or do you see their heart? Do you immediately judge them because of what they look like, how they look, what they dress like, how they respond to you? Do you immediately judge them and tell them, aha, you are, and then you make your statement. You judge the book by its cover instead of reading the content. James chapter 2 verse 2 says this, for if there comes into your assembly a man with a gold ring and a, godly, a goodly apparel, and there come in a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect for him that wears the good clothing or the gay clothing. It's interesting how that word has changed, isn't it? You know, if you have respect of him that weareth the gay clothing, and we know that gay means happy, it means rejoicing, it means party, that party clothes. And yet the world has rewritten the dictionary. You know, if, if you want, what you should do is get, um, I, I got it here, it's uh, Noah Webster's, uh, dictionary, the 1828 dictionary. Almost every word definition has a Bible verse attached to it. Kind of cool. But anyway, you know, if you have respect of him that wears the gay clothing and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, but you say to the poor, stand over there or sit under my footstool, are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? And you read that, and it's like, how often do we do this? And what was James referring to? Well, James, being the half-brother of Jesus, grew up with God in his household, grew up with the perfect son of God as his brother, watching him eat breakfast, eat lunch, eat dinner, work in the shop, and help his mom, and help you know, his dad while his dad Joseph, or his stepdad Joseph was still alive. And James rejected Jesus Christ all the way up until Jesus rose from the dead, and James himself became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and he became a strong minister because he realized realize my brother, the carpenter wearing carpenter's clothing is God. And I rejected him for over 30 years of my life. And then when he rose from the dead, I understood him as God and my judgment needs to be repented of. And he understood this. So when you see that carpenter come into the room, you don't know if it's God. You see, and James had it. Do you judge the outward appearance? He says, if anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Why is someone more of Christ than others? You know, we do that. Well, I, I think Jesus likes me more than he likes you because of the way you are. 
You see, oh, you do those things. You go to movie theaters. Ooh, you can't go watch a movie. That's unbiblical. Oh, wait a minute. What do you watch on TV? That's unbiblical too. Oh, how entertainment has changed. I'm not even going down that soapbox road. You know how many people I've had say, I'm going to bring you a soapbox? Please don't. But every, I got this box, I'm going to put soap on there. <laughs> you know, in, in Christ, I consider him. We should not consider myself or someone else better. You know, it's just as bad to look at someone and say, God must like them better because of who they are. They're the pastor, they're the leader, they're the teacher, they're the, the Bible study person, they're the one who reads the Bible, they're the, they're the prayer. God likes them better. That's just as bad as saying God likes me more than you. You see, God likes all of us the same. There is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no poor, there is no rich, there is no slave, there is no free in the presence of the Lord. We all stand naked before God. And he doesn't look at us for what we look like. He looks at us here when Jesus was there in the courtyard and Peter denied him three times. And the Bible says that their eyes locked. It doesn't mean that Jesus looked at Peter and says, aha, external Peter, I told you. He looked through Peter. He saw his heart. He saw a broken heart. He saw Peter run out weeping. He knew what Peter did. You see, he looks through us. Consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification, not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed lest I seem to terrify you by letters. So Paul now says this, our authority. You see, he's not, he doesn't stand up initially. Well, take a very quick look at verse 11. It says, let such a person consider this, that we are in word by letters, or what we are in word by letters when we are absent, uh, such will also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. Paul says, I want you to understand this. My letters, my words that I'm writing to you are just as powerful as the words that I'm going to speak to you when I get there. And he says in verse 8, our authority. He could have easily said, I was on the road to Damascus. Jesus chose me. He didn't choose you. I'm the one who's called. I'm the one who started the church. How dare you come? He could have got very offended and very defensive. And, uh, but he says this. If I should boast somewhat more about our authority. Oh, by the way, which the Lord gave us. And he doesn't say anything. Look what he says. For edification or the building up of you guys and not for your destruction. You see, I didn't come here to destroy you. I came here to build you up. You see, the believer's walk is to build others up. The believer's walk is to strengthen others. The believer's walk is to minister to others as believers. The believer's walk is to make sure that when you're together with the body of believers, you strengthen one another instead of tearing each other down, regardless of what authority you have. Am I more authoritative than you? The answer is no. Neither are you more authoritative than me. But you're the pastor. You're supposed to be more authoritative. I have certain more responsibilities, yes, but that doesn't make me more authoritative. What it does do is it allows me to say, as Paul did, look, being called by God, I could boast in that, and I can tell you what I'm supposed to do and how you're supposed to be because of what I tell you to do, but my authority, which the Lord gave us, should build you up. You should never come to church and walk out of here destroyed or feel like you've been beaten down. Or fe Maybe some of you should. <laughs> and here's the reason why. The message, and, and, I, and, and you know the story, and I've had people tell me this, who told you about me? What do you mean, who told you about me? Somebody had to tell you because you talked about my situation. Really? I have no idea. What's your name? Yeah, I'm Matt, you know, whatever their name is. Well, I'll be honest with you, no one told me about you. This is the Holy Spirit talking to you. When you leave church on Sunday, do you have two different conversations about what the message was about? You say one thing, the message was about this, and your wife or husband says, no, no, it was about this. Same message, different, not interpretation, but different message by the Holy Spirit to you. Because maybe we need to feel convicted. Maybe we need to be exalted. Maybe we need to be encouraged. Maybe we need to realize you're not as good as you think you are. Because, man, I need to hear that. And so Paul says this, my authority, hey, God gave it to me. 
not for me, but for your building up, your edification, not to destroy you. And if I stood up here and beat you down every day, I, I, I still laugh at Chuck Smith years ago before he left the Foursquare denomination. He would go to his, you know, Foursquare denomination uh, bishop meeting or whatever. And they say, all right, Chuck, how many people got saved in your church? And he was like, well, I started with 17 last week and now we went up to 18 because my wife gave birth. So I think we're doing pretty good. So we've got 18 now. Well, how many people got saved? Well, I'm doing the, the salvation message every single Sunday, but it's to the same saved people. That's when he realized, I better start just teaching the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and thus the Jesus movement and everything that happened. It's not about Chuck Smith. It's about the calling that God had on the life of an individual, whoever that is. Look at Billy Graham. Look at D.L. Moody. Look at Charles Spurgeon. Look at Finney. Look, take a look at the Apostle Paul. Take a look at Peter and Matthew and Mark and John. Take a look at those guys. Look at what Judas missed out on. You ever think about that, what Judas missed out on? Oh, the hard-heartedness of an individual who's there and watching destroying himself. Paul says, I'm not going to be ashamed for your edification, lest, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. Oh, my letters are really strong. If, and he says, for his letters, they say, these are the critics, are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. There are certain people who have the ability to communicate and the voice to communicate. The, and when they speak, people listen because it's just raw, you know. And then there are guys like me who has kind of a nasally voice, you know, and I'm not large in presence. I'm, I'm just there, you know, and I can get very offended, you know, if you put me next to, you know, someone who is that way and they say this, you know, I, I have to say, you know what, Lord, none of that matters. For they say his letters are weighty and powerful, but when he shows up, he's weak and his speech is like just contemptible. Have you ever heard someone say, that's just not for me, I can do better? I'm going to go to a church until I find someone who does better than me. I know someone who actually went to a church and they say, I have no idea what this guy is talking about, but man, he's a great presenter. That doesn't make sense to me. You're supposed to come to church and understand what the word of God says based on the communication that the guy up here is speaking to you instead of saying, I have no idea what he's saying because he's speaking so far above my head that I don't even understand. Why is he speaking Latin? To I remember when, you know, and this is not to knock the Catholic church, but they were talking about bringing Latin back into the Catholic churches for their, you know, for their services. And I remember someone was saying, oh, that would be great if they do. And I said, well, why would it be good if they go back to Latin? They said, because I have no idea what they're saying. But it just sounds so good. And I'm like, no, that's not what it's about. The speech, the communication, the presentation, it's not about the presentation. It's not about the guy and how good he is, how comical he is. And this is the problem that we have now. We, we see over and over again how the church of Jesus Christ has led toward their good presenter. Though they're a good motivational speaker. And yet they call themselves a pastor. I got a friend of mine who sent me this, if I can find it. Um, let's see. There it is. You guys have probably seen this. And it says this. This is one of those, uh, um, I think they call it a meme, where they send you a picture from the online thing. I'm not techno service, techno savvy. But it says, if Paul were alive today, Paul would write this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the churches of the United States of America. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he addresses the church and he says this, I don't even really know where to begin with you guys. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. Because we have turned the gospel of Jesus Christ into an entertainment center. You know, and there are pastors who stand behind the pulpit who will actually say, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm not a pastor. But the people come to hear me. They come to listen to how I present. They come to listen to what not is said, but what is presented. What's on the stage in the background? What's on the voice? What's there? You know, have you got the perfect voice for a radio show? Do you have the perfect voice to present yourself in front of others? And when you got, like Paul says, 
someone who's got a contemptible speech, whether it's nasally, whether it's squeaky, whether it's quiet. Jonathan Edwards spoke in a very monotone voice. And other teachers do, but you listen to the words that they speak. Have you ever said, you know, I can do better than him? That's pride. That's arrogance. I did that. I remember sitting under one pastor and I said, you know what? I'm not getting anything from this guy. This guy is not feeding me. As soon as I said that, as soon as those words left my lips, God said, oh, you fool. What is he teaching? He's always teaching your word. Oh, so what you're saying is I'm inadequate. Uh-oh. Hmm. And I learned from that point on, no matter who the speaker is, you listen to God's word, not the speaker. Because the minute the speaker says, you know, I just can't, or the minute anyone in a church body says, they're just not feeding me because it just doesn't do it for me. I think I'll go here or I'll do this or I'll start that or whatever they do. That's arrogance and pride. Because Every word of God is every word of God. Now, I have to admit, there are some people who stand behind a pulpit who don't teach God's word. You need to leave a church like that. You need to walk out. If you're online and you're watching other junk, and I can list a slew of teachers that you should never listen to. Oh, I can listen. List them. Maybe I should. But then someone will get offended. Because they listen to him all the time. No. Here's the sad thing. Most people who watch these people probably know they shouldn't be listening to them, but they like what they say because they get something from them that is not necessarily biblical, but it makes them feel good. See, the gospel is not a feel-good gospel. As a matter of fact, here's what Jesus said. In, in, the, um, in John chapter 15, Jesus was speaking. He says, these things I command you, and this is verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. And then he says this in verse 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of this world, I have chosen you out of this world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him who sent me. You see, we, the, the gospel is not a feel-good gospel. And if you're looking at teachers and watching guys on TV or on the internet that make you feel good all the time, there's a problem with that. And I'm not against feeling good. I want to feel good. I really do. But sometimes I get condemned because of what I teach you guys. You know, I plan what I'm going to teach and I look at my notes and I go, Lord, these are the things that are there. And then all of a sudden I feel convicted because sometimes I look at myself and I say, I'm not that personality. Here's a cool thing. I don't need to be his personality. You know why? Because God has chosen me in whatever capacity. And it doesn't matter. Because look what Paul says as we go. Let each person consider this in verse 11. Let each person consider this, consider this that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will also be indeed when we are present. Man, when I come, hey, what I say, if you don't change the way I write is the way I'm going to speak to you. Now, what would you rather have? The possible Paul of face-to-face, -face, speaking what he wrote? Or would you rather read a letter, fix it, so that when Paul comes, he doesn't have to bring it up? He says, for we dare not class ourselves, because the minute you begin to compare yourself, the minute you look at man and you say, oh, here we go, man is doing this, when we class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves by the... Or, but they measure themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. A lot of themselves, isn't there? 
Basically, it boils down to this. I am looking at them and I am comparing myself to them because they're a man and I'm a man. And if I compare my manness with their manness, my manness will never attain to what their manness is. Or I am far greater than that. Because you are not wise if you do this. Why is it that we always want to keep up with the Joneses? We always want to make sure that they're, the, oh, they got a new car. I got to keep up with them. Oh, they drive that. I got to get that. I, they got this house. I got to have that house, you know. Why is it that we're always trying to keep up with the Joneses and trying to stay established? Because we're comparing themselves with myself, which means themselves here and themselves there always have to be equal. That's not the way it works. I don't want to be equal with you guys, and you should not ever want to be equal with me, ever. Because God called you. He made you. Can you imagine if there were more of you running around? And you ran into yourself. And you started talking with yourself as you are. What your actual response was. You would probably go, oh, gag me. I'm really like that? What am I saying? Because yourself is going to be honest with yourself. And yourself is going to say, hey, you're just like me. No, I'm not like you. I don't dress like that. I don't act like that. I don't speak like that. And then you realize, man, Lord, think there's only one of me. Because if there were more of me, I would be in trouble. Because when we compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, why is it that people always commend themselves? I can do so much better than they can. I can do that job better. I can do that teaching better. I can do that ministry better. I can do that leadership better. I can do that cooking better. I can do that sewing better. Oh, the betterness is better. Don't teach me how to sew. I've been doing it for 36 years. Yeah, but you were taught wrong for 36 years. It's like the old lady that had the deep secret. Grandma, why do you always cut the ham in half and cook that? You guys know this story. Well, if you don't, why do you always cut the ham? Oh, that's the way grandma did it. And great grandma did it that way. And great grandma did it that way. We always cook it. And then you find out what the secret of cutting the ham in half was. It was because the whole stupid thing wouldn't fit in the oven. <laughs> it was no secret recipe. It wouldn't fit. So she had to cook it in two. She cut it in half and she put it in to cook that half. And, but now we got monster ovens. Now we got an oven that can hold a 4,000 pound turkey. You shove that in the oven and you're still going to cut it in half. And it's like, because it's a secret family recipe. No. Because with those who commend themselves by they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, they are not wise. How many times have people left churches because they felt they can do a better job than the leadership and the pastor and they're going to go out and do it better? You know, here's the great news about churches, okay? Let me just fill you guys in on a secret that no one knows. In the body of Christ, as you see Christ is ahead and you have all these churches underneath them, there is no such thing as a perfect church. There is no such thing as a perfect leader. There is no such thing as a perfect leadership. There is no such thing as a perfect teacher. However, when you've got a spirit-led pastor who is under the headship of Jesus Christ, and he is willing to knuckle down and take God's word and present it raw as it is, that's the spirit moving. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. Hook, line, sinker, boat, and motor. It doesn't matter how it goes. You're going to get it all. Vegetables, meat, dessert, all the blessings that God's word. And I would rather listen to the worst presenter in the world, someone like Jonathan Edwards, where the conviction is there to live a righteous, holy life, where the exhortation is there to walk out and say, Lord, thank you for confirming to me that I did that. Not because of me, but because of you. And thank you, Lord, that I'm willing to stand firm and serve in a church. Because let me tell you this. If you leave the church to go find the other church, good luck. Because the minute you step into the church, you just ruined it. Then you come back to this church and ruin us. And then you go start your own church and you ruin it. You see, it's amazing how your Time in service, as we say in the military, time in the ministry teaches you the actions of self. Because you look at self and you look inward and you go, oh, that stunk. That was, that was a wrong advice I gave to that person. I shouldn't have said that. And you realize, Lord, like Paul said at the beginning, myself and pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, help me to be that way. Lowly among you, not bold and saying, I'm going to authorize myself over you. No, I want to be able to do this, not comparing myself 
to others. He says in verse 13, we, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. He doesn't say, look, I'm going to boast a little bit and it's all about me. He says, my little bit of boasting is going to be about you guys too, because he goes on and he says, we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of the things beyond measure, that is in another man's labors, but having hope. That as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. We came to you called. And if you go to the book of Acts, you see this Macedonia and all the journeys going to Rome, going to Philippi, going to the area of Galatia and all these places. And God called Paul. Let me just say this. The calling of an apostle, the calling of a minister, the calling of a pastor, the calling of someone to sit in a pulpit and pastor and teach a church, pastor, teacher, to do that is exactly that, a calling that never, ever goes away. And how many times have pastors spoke like Jeremiah and said, I have had it. I have been ministering for 20 years. No one got saved. All I get is snarling and angry faces. They've thrown me in jail. I've sat in the sewage. I am fed up. I quit. And you walk away. The problem is, even though you get up in your flesh and walk away, there's a spiritual calling there. And it's almost like, as you're walking away, you can kind of feel that magnet pulling you and all of a sudden you're sucked back into it and you say like Jeremiah, oh, but then the fire in my bones burned for the word of God to be presented and I had to do it again. That's the calling. They don't care how tough it is. They don't care how hard it is. They don't care how rejected the person is, but the calling never goes away. A hireling, on the other hand, goes, hey, look, the wolves are here. I'm out of here, boom, and they're gone. And they run. No one got saved, you know. It used to be the average time for a minister was about three years. And then they would quit. Now it's down to like two years. Because no one likes me. I thought I would have 6,000 people the first week. Have a mega church and have the building and have this and have that. And they go on and they woe is me. And they feel bad. When in reality... Maybe the Lord has only called you to minister to that three or that two or that one. Or maybe to realize it's not about them. Maybe it's about your own family. Maybe that's who you're supposed to minister to first. And then God will do something. Who knows what your calling is? But this position Paul is saying, I can boast a little bit here, a little bit there. But my boasting is not going to be overextended because our authority <laughs> did not extend to you for it was because of Jesus Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure in other men's labors. People like to ride the coattails. You know how many name droppers there are? I always... <sighs> name dropping doesn't do a thing. Yeah, yeah, I went to so-and-so's church. Yeah. But the, yeah, him and I are like this, but I was there from the beginning. Yeah, I was always there at the church. You know. I know superstar such-and-such. Such. I went to school with so-and-so. I know rock band singer so-and-so. I know Christian artist such-and-such. Such. You know, name droppers don't do it. Usually the people who drop names are the people who don't know anyone. It was a high five as they're walking down the thing. You know, I know you know, uh, whoever your favorite sports guy is. And just because you just happened to be on the edge and you leaned over like this and he high-fived you as you walked by, he's my buddy, my friend, I'm never washing my hand again. <laughs> you know, we're like this, he touched me. Great guy. No, it's not that. You see this, this difficulty, this ministry, the love, the boasting beyond measure. It's not another man's labor. The Bible tells us not to build on another man's foundation. It always interests me how many people want to put a church right next to the megachurch. God, started, everybody wants to go to Hawaii. All the ministers want, I'm called to go to Hawaii. When, when we were living in Hawaii, there were like four Calvary chapels on the island. On Oahu. And Oahu's not that big. It's a big island to drive around because the traffic's so heavy, so it takes you four and a half hours to drive through the island. But it doesn't take much. And 
when we were there, there were, I think right now on the island of Oahu, there are like 20 some odd Calvary chapels. 15, maybe 15 Calvary chapels at this point. I don't know, I have to call Charles and ask him. <laughs> but but yeah, you got all these Calvary chapels and it's like some of them are 10 minutes away from each other. And I'm thinking to myself, why? I'm called to Hawaii. I was a fool, I left Hawaii. <laughs> I should have stayed there, you know? I should have, it wouldn't have been, you know, the whole thing, but I'm not wealthy enough to stay in Hawaii. But I'm thinking to myself, if I wanted to start a church, I'm not going to go next door to the big church, where the big church is, to start a church next to the big church. I would go to the big church and say, where should I go? You can be like Paul. I'm mean, just going to go to Corinth. I'm going to go to Philippi. I'm going to go to Ephesus. I'm going to go to where the people need the gospel, because guess what? Everywhere you go, they need the gospel. We do need a few more Calvaries in this area. We can use one down, especially down Newport Richie. There's nothing down past pa County Line Road. Other than that, the closest one is going to be Palm Harbor. Don't drive to Palm Harbor. He's not as good as me. <laughs> Sorry, Brett. <laughs> My brother. You know, and, the, and then we need someone up north because past us, the next one's up in the panhandle. Oh, excuse me. No, you got, you got Crystal River and you've got Homosassa. But, you know, then you pass that, you got the panhandle up on the coast and you got Gainesville. But we need more Calvary chapels here because we can put one way over on the east side. We can put one, you know, somewhere. But here's the thing. Don't build it on someone else's coattails. The worst thing in the world is when they come here and they try to fish from our pond, which isn't that big of a pond. I'm a pastor of a church. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. How many people come to your church? No one. Here's my business card. And it's like, you know, you're better off doing it organically, you know? But having hope, look at the rest of verse 15, but having hope that as your faith increases, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. You know, I got a picture of myself and Chuck Smith on the wall back in my office. I don't know Chuck. He doesn't know me. I knew Chuck a little bit. We met on a couple of occasions. We had some conversations, but I didn't know him. So I can't boast in my accomplishment because of Chuck. I don't even boast in my accomplishment because as far as I'm concerned, there is no accomplishment. The accomplishment is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, I'm going to build this church up so the gospel goes out. And a lot of people have spread the gospel from here out. Amen to that. I like verse 17. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Oh, please do that. Please glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved. I think we don't need to elaborate on that. We all know someone who's approved and commended themselves. And again, what does Matthew say? Well, Jesus spoke it in Matthew. It's not the commendation of the one speaking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. John chapter 6, verse 40 says, the will of the Father is for every man to believe in Jesus Christ. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? You can say it, you can declare it, you can commend yourself. I've done all this in your name, Lord. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Oh, you who practice lawlessness. When you take a look at the book of Galatians and you see in chapter 4, verse 9, it says this. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, he says, how you turn to the weak and the beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. You know God, he is known, he knows you. Why do you turn back to the ways of this world? Don't commend yourself. Don't brag upon yourself. That's pride. But he who the Lord commends, that's what matters. What matters is how the Lord sees you. What matters is how your heart is. Now you've got to remember chapter 7 in the book of Matthew where it says, Behold, depart from me, for I never knew you. That's for unbelievers. That's not for the backslider. That's not for the one who's failed. God never loses anyone. 
But for those who claim to know Jesus Christ, who claim to know God, he's going to be like the sons of Sceva where the demons yell, hey, we know Jesus and we know Paul of who you speak, but we have no idea who you are. Boom. The ministry of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a game of entertainment. It is not a game of who's got the most. It is not a game of let's get everyone else to come. It's an amazing thing to me how many people are reaching out to unbelievers by sending notifications to pastors of churches saying, send your congregation our way. Why would I want to send a bunch of believers who already believe in Jesus Christ to another church to try to get them saved in that church? It makes no sense. Why don't you go fishing in the pond where there are not believers? Nothing wrong with conferences. Matter of fact, in February, if you want to go to the conference over in Merritt Island, I highly recommend that you register online. Um, it is going to fill up very quickly. But that's a different thing. You're getting together with a bunch of other believers to a pastor's conference. They call it a pastor's conference. You can go even though you're not a pastor. It's President's Day in February, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's a good time. It's a great time. And if you can go, go. And if not, you can watch it online. But that's not sending people to another church to get saved. You see, we have to let the Lord do the calling. Because who builds the church? God does. Who is in charge of the church? Jesus Christ, not the pastor. See, and Paul is trying to get this across to the church of Corinth. When we get into chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Paul... <laughs> He just really, you know, and when you see, I say again, let no one think me a fool otherwise. At least receive me as a fool that I may also boast a little. For what I speak, I speak according to the Lord. But as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting. Paul is going to go through in chapter 11 and lay out the stuff that he went through, not in defense of what he is, but why he went through it and how he got through it. I want us to stand and I want the worship guys to come on up. Father God, as we come before you in Jesus' name, I ask that we would just take into account every word that is written to us, Lord. And as we see Paul the Apostle ministering his love and his mercy, his weakness, his strength, the words that were written and the words that were spoken face to face, how he addressed people, I pray, Lord, that we would do the same. We as believers are all called to something. We may be called to our neighbor's house. We may be called to our family. We may be called to the world as a minister. But Lord, we all have a calling as a born again believer in Jesus Christ. And I pray that our calling would never be interrupted by man trying to approve man to himself. Because when we compare themselves with themselves, we find themselves inferior, and that is foolishness. The calling begins at salvation. When, Paul, when Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus, the Bible says he was out leading and persecuting the church leading them into captivity, bringing them into bondage because they would not reject Jesus Christ until Jesus showed up and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When he said, who art thou, Lord? He was saved at that moment. Once that salvation came, the final calling came when the old prophet came in and prayed and says, you're going to receive your eyesight. Your name is now going to be Paul. And you're going to minister to the Gentiles. If you're not saved today, you don't get saved because you're expecting a calling. You're getting saved because you're being called to salvation. And then as you get to know who Jesus Christ is in your life, then you realize that that calling is confirmed in your life and you move forward. But you got to get saved. The salvation comes according to the scriptures. And now is the time of salvation. It is time to get saved. We need to confess our sins because there is remission of sins. You need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you shall be saved. And so, Father, we come in Jesus' name asking. And anyone who says this prayer, anyone who confesses these words to you, would show themselves as a humble servant just giving his entire or her entire existence to you. It's not showy. It's not flashy. It's just raw, heartfelt, I quit.
and in quitting were built up. And so I pray in Jesus' name that our hearts would be touched and there would be a salvation within those individuals. So Lord, we come before you asking that as we walk out of here today, that we would be invigorated, revived, brought back into the presence of the Lord in the context of just excitement about the gospel, ministering to those around us in every aspect. We thank you for your grace, your goodness, and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Let's sing this last song together. Thank you for joining us this week for God's message. Next week, come back and we will continue to grow and hear from God's word. If you've not received Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. It's putting your complete faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection made the complete payment for our sins. So if you've made a decision for Christ or would like to know more about our church, you can contact us through the telephone number that's down below or the website address. So until then, may God bless you and keep you in his word.